almost everybody's history lessons at school will have mentioned Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass, but very little is actually known about the event. It's hardly ever mentioned why the events took place, who ordered it, or how it affected the course of history. It's usually just discussed in a vacuum. Hopefully, in this video I can shed some more light on the time period. Hitler had spent years talking about the Jewish people, yet when he came to power, the actual repression against them was so mild that it disappointed some of the more radical corners of the party. Hitler had actually quite logically decided that if he was going to separate the Jews from the Germans, he wanted it done without causing a gigantic international uproar. After all, one of his biggest enemies was the foreign press, especially the Jewish owned ones, and if he made any move too harsh on the Jews, they could quite easily ruin his reputation and make foreign policy an impossible minefield to manoeuvre. He set about doing this by actually working with Zionist organisations. Zionism, in modern times, is pretty much a nothing word, much like fascism or racism. However, in this instance, I mean it in the literal Jewish people wanting a homeland for the Jews sense. Almost as soon as Hitler came to power, he was set upon by various groups of international businessmen, and German goods were boycotted. This is where the infamous Judea declares war on Germany newspaper headline comes from, that is often used out of context. Hitler managed to get some of these boycotts removed by working with the Zionists to establish a plan for the relocation of Germany's Jews, or at least those that would go willingly to British Palestine. Some, of course, refused to revoke their boycotts no matter what, unless Hitler was removed from office. This Palestine scheme was known as the Havara Agreement. The plan didn't really work to the scale that both sides would have hoped for, but regardless, this was Hitler's primary method of dealing with the problem long term. Of course, in everyday society, there was shops who refused Jews entry, and had signs saying Jews not wanted, but this was the case in the United States, or even Great Britain too, albeit not on the same scale obviously. This was the situation in 1938, as the events of Kristallnacht neared. Hitler was viewed by some in the party as being too soft, as opposed to too harsh, despite his increasing restrictions on Jews. But the outside world, of course, viewed Hitler's rhetoric against the Jews as abominable. It was this minefield that the Führer had to navigate. Before we begin, a quick disclaimer. This is a video about both Adolf Hitler's life, and also about the Night of Broken Glass. Both are extremely controversial. I don't need to make a huge speech really, but please just use common sense. This video is purely a work of history. It is not political in any way, shape, or form, and I will express no opinions of my own. Thank you. Also, this video is part of the larger series on the life of Adolf Hitler. If you'd like to start from the start, then the playlist is linked down below, and also displayed front and centre on my channel homepage. The video can just as easily be viewed on its own, however. And finally, a huge thank you to my Patreon, Subscribestar, and YouTube members for their constant support. My videos are not monetized immediately, and have to undergo a manual review process. Whilst every video does indeed get monetized eventually, it usually takes a few days to a week. As a result, the vast majority of my income comes from the kind donations that you guys provide on these websites. I cannot thank you enough, as this is my full-time job. If you're new, or even a regular viewer, and you enjoy my content, want to join our Discord, our weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, or even our Minecraft server, then please do consider joining up in one of the links in the description. Even the $2 tier helps immensely. Thank you. Nineteen thirty eight was a year of Hitler's Germany jumping from crisis to crisis. Early in the year, the Blomberg Fritsch affair ended with Hitler shuffling the old conservatives out of his government and replacing them with newer faces. In February and March, the Anschluss dominated the world's news headlines. Hitler managed to make his way through both of these events relatively untouched. The latter did show Hitler's willingness to occupy foreign nations, however, regardless of the fact that it was the Austrians themselves who wanted the invasion. The peace didn't last for long. A few months later, the world was rocked by the Sudeten crisis. At points, Europe was within hours of war breaking out, but thanks to Neville Chamberlain, the nations of Europe were saved from such a fate. Germans were being massacred in the Sudetenland, and after Benes, the president of Czechoslovakia, tried to bait Hitler into mobilizing his army and creating a fake scandal. Hitler put his foot down. In the end, the Sudetenland was handed over to Germany, and Benes ran off with his tail between his legs where he would continue to shill for a war with Germany, in collaboration with other paid warmongers like Winston Churchill and Duff Cooper. The Germans of the Sudetenland had been saved, but the German international reputation had not been. The warmongers, chief among them Churchill, began to spin the Sudeten crisis as a first step in Germany's path to world domination. Sadly, 
people genuinely began to believe that Hitler incorporating 3 million Germans into the nation of Germany was the beginning of a larger conquest. A major triumph was slowly but surely being spun into a capitulation to Hitler. Chamberlain's moral action of saving the British people from war was starting to be viewed as cowardice. This is the false narrative that remains to this day. Regardless, this false narrative was now the reality in part of the public mind, and it was the situation that Hitler had to reckon with. After these crises, particularly the Austrian one, there was thousands and thousands of Jews who wanted to leave the country, as Hitler slowly took a tougher and tougher line to be rid of them, and the Germans were more than happy to accommodate. The problem was, as was already an issue with the rest of the Jews in Germany, nobody wanted them. The Brits would only accept so many in British Palestine. The French wanted nothing to do with the matter. In fact, the French foreign minister had begged Ribbentrop not to flood France with German Jews, as he said they already had enough, and they were even considering Madagascar for the purpose of getting rid of them. The new Czech government had been replaced by moderates, as opposed to Benes's anti-Hitler extremists, and the nation took a pro-German line. In fact, they were already effectively begging Germany for protection from Hungary, who was eager to avenge Trianon. The Czechs weren't big fans of the Jews anyway, but now with Benes gone as a restraining factor, they had no tolerance for the matter at all. They were happy to toe the German line and impose anti-Jewish restrictions. In some cases, they were even more eager than the Germans and began to deport these Jews by the thousands. Again, the problem was where to put them. The obvious answer for the place to put all these Jews was Poland, the nation with the most Jews in Europe by far. The issue again was that the Polish government was incredibly anti-Semitic themselves and shuddered at the thought of thousands more Jews being pumped into the nation. Ambassador Joseph Lipski of Poland had even said directly to Hitler that if he somehow managed to solve the Jewish problem in Europe, then the Poles would build a statue of Hitler in Warsaw. In March 1938, the Poles quickly passed a law to prevent the influx of Jews that would inevitably come from Vienna, which housed thousands of Polish Jews. These Jews were stripped of their Polish citizenship rights. After the Munich Agreement, the Poles panicked even more, and they immediately implemented harsher restrictions on Jewish repatriation. They wanted absolutely nothing to do with the issue, despite an overwhelming amount of the Jews being Polish Jews. The date of 31st of October was given. After that, there would be no more Polish Jews crossing back into Poland, and as a result, the last days of October were an absolute frenzy of activity on the Polish-German border. The Germans themselves were more than happy to take advantage of the deadline. They cancelled 12,000 Polish Jews' residence permits in the country, and amidst all the chaos, they sent train loads of these Jews across the border before the Poles could figure out what on earth was going on. The Poles refused the Jews, and they ended up living a horrible refugee existence on the border of the two nations, where they relied on the Red Cross to survive. On one of these trains were 484 Polish Jews from Hanover. Most important among them was Mr. and Mrs. Grinspan, and their daughters who had moved to Germany in 1911, and there they had a son, Herschel. Herschel Grinspan was to become a name that would go down in history, but for now, he was a nobody. His parents had wanted him to go to Palestine, however, he was told that he was too young and had to wait a year. Instead, it was decided that Herschel should go and stay in Paris with his aunt and uncle. In September 1936, he illegally entered France through Belgium. During the following two years, he lived amongst other Eastern Jews in a Paris enclave where Yiddish was spoken. He learned barely a word of French over his two years there and rarely met Frenchmen. His time in Paris somewhat mirrored Hitler's in Vienna. He was a wanderer and instead of an artist, he was an inspiring poet. As he wasn't a legal resident of France, he couldn't study, and as a result, his life went nowhere. With no clear path to achieving anything, he quickly became depressed and irritable. He refused to get a job, and his aunt and uncle described him as a useless drain on their resources. On top of this, he was well known for his fiery temper, and was quick to respond to verbal anti-Semitism with his fists, and due to his upbringing in Jewish schools, he was far more Jewish than his parents had been, even for Eastern Jewish standards. As a result, he made the Jewish cause in Germany his own, and the anti-Jewish sentiment there was driving him mad. To make matters worse, in late 1938, the French police were actually looking for him in order to deport him, given that he was an illegal immigrant after all. To those around him, he would rant and rave about the Jewish situation in Germany, and he was essentially a loose cannon waiting to explode. 
He had nothing, and he was going nowhere, with nothing to live for. All he had left was his family back in Germany, whom he missed so much, and would frequently talk about. On November the 3rd, Grinspan received a letter from his sister, and it was here that he learned of his parents' and sister's demeaning repatriation to Poland. Herschel immediately tried to shake his uncle down for money, and after wild protests, he either gave in or was robbed for 300 francs by his nephew, who then walked out. Four days later, on the 7th of November, he turned up at the German embassy, seeking revenge. At 9.45am, he told the receptionist that he was a German resident with important intelligence that he wanted to give to the most senior diplomat available. Only the second most senior official in the building, Ernst von Raff, was available to meet him. Herschel had actually walked past German ambassador von Welzek on his way in, who was leaving for his daily walk. Herschel walked into Raff's office and was asked to provide the document he claimed to possess. Instead, Herschel pulled out a gun and shot Raff five times, shouting, quote, You're a filthy Bosch. In the name of 12,000 persecuted Jews, here is the document, end quote. Herschel did not attempt to evade the police, and he cried to them, quote, Being a Jew is not a crime. I am not a dog. I have a right to live, and the Jewish people have a right to exist on this earth. Wherever I have been, I have been chased like an animal, end quote. The truth was, however, that Herschel had just killed a random, completely innocent man simply because he was German. In no way was this going to make things better, only worse. The victim, in fact, was under investigation by the Gestapo and wasn't even anti-Semitic. Raff died of his injuries two days later on the 9th of November, the 15th anniversary of the most important date in Germany, the Beer Hall Putsch. Hitler and all the others were gathered in Munich for the yearly services when they got the news. Herschel couldn't have possibly asked for worse timing. Patriotic feeling was at a maximum, and the German people were never going to be in a position to tolerate such a targeted attack. The reaction was spontaneous and immediate. Within hours, synagogues were on fire across Germany. In fact, such events were occurring all over Germany before the Führer even received the news. Here, he ordered that no counter-protests should be arranged, and he was informed that the Munich police were already cracking down on huge anti-Jewish demonstrations. Goebbels, on the other hand, who was currently in disgrace with Hitler over his high-profile cheating scandal, had a bright idea to get back into Hitler's good books. The greatest public speaker Germany had, the very face of the public regime, made the pogroms his own cause. He told party officials to organise and fan the flames of the current spontaneous demonstrations. The SA was his vehicle for doing so, and plain-clothed men quickly began making things worse, whilst also trying to make it seem as if the party was not responsible. He would frequently talk of the Gaulitis getting cold feet, but he was proud of the SA, that they simply went ahead and began smashing up Jewish businesses and synagogues. He even ordered particular synagogues in his own district of Berlin to be smashed. An action report by the leader of the SA group Nordmark read, quote, At about 10pm on November the 9th, the need for the operation was put to a number of Gauleiters assembled in the Munich Hotel Schottenhammel by an anonymous member of the Nazi party's Reichsleitung. I thereupon volunteered the services of my SA group Nordmark to the Gauleiter, Hinrich Loss. At about 10.30pm, he telephoned his chief of staff in Kiel. A Jew has fired a shot. A German diplomat is dead. There are wholly superfluous places of congregation in Friedrichstadt, Kiel, and Lübeck, and these people are still trading in shops in our midst. We don't need either the one or the other. There's to be no plundering, nor any manhandling. Foreign Jews are not to be molested. If there's any resistance, use your firearms. The whole operation is to be in plain clothes, and is to be over by 5 a.m., end quote. It's important to remember that the Third Reich isn't as streamlined as one might imagine. The reality was that there were several smaller competing groups. Himmler had his SS, Goering had his industrialists, Goebbels had his propaganda network, and Bormann controlled the circle around Hitler, just to name a few. Most of these men didn't like each other, and would often pursue opposing aims, in which Hitler was sometimes kept in the dark. This time, however, Hitler was with Himmler, and Himmler began to receive reports from his Gestapo that Goebbels' propaganda offices were whipping up anti-Jewish demonstrations, and that he was ordering the police, who were meant to be under the control of Himmler, not to intervene. Himmler turned straight to the Führer for further instructions, and he was ordered to protect Jewish lives and Jewish property. According to Himmler, it appeared as if this was the first Hitler had heard of such things when he told him. Trying to put this genie back in the bottle was never going to be an easy task, however. 
After all, Goebbels held more sway on the public than anyone else except Hitler himself. One of the main issues was that the attempts to put down these demonstrations were only ever going to be half-hearted by anyone except those with an eye for foreign policy. Helping the Jews wasn't for the Jews' benefit, but for the Germans. If a medieval-style pogrom erupted in Germany, the nation that was being accused of mistreating Jews, then it would be the biggest hit to Germany's international reputation imaginable. On a personal level, disregarding what outsiders thought, then, there was of course thousands of Germans who saw this as their chance to finally get out the Jews, and they relished the opportunity. They had been held back for years, and now they felt they were being allowed to act. In fact, by 1am that same evening, the synagogue next to Hitler's hotel was on fire, and his adjutant was called to come and collect his belongings in case the fire spread. The attacks continued into the night, and Hitler barely got any sleep. Still into the early morning, he was demanding to know what was going on, and was demanding that party officials put a stop to it now. At 3am, Rudolf Hess, Hitler's deputy, sent out a message to all the Gauleiters, quote, On express orders issued at the highest level of all, there is to be no arson or the like, whatever, under any circumstances, against Jewish businesses, end quote. By the early hours of the next morning, Goebbels was getting the message that he was in fact making things worse, and he spent his sleepless night on the telephone, trying to calm down the mess that he himself had created. It was too late, however, and dozens of Jews had died in a single evening. Foreign Minister Ribbentrop immediately informed Hitler of the ramifications abroad. In the eyes of the world, Germany was now willing to resort to physical violence in order to persecute their Jews. Beforehand, many were willing to tolerate, or even agreed with, the economic and social restrictions on Jews, but for many this was a step too far. How obvious of a mistake such a reaction was is evident in the people who condemned it. First and foremost, one of the most radical national socialists of all, Heinrich Himmler, immediately condemned Goebbels for the obvious reason. Quote, the order was given by the propaganda directorate, and I suspect that Goebbels, in his craving for power, which I noticed a long time ago, and also in his empty-headedness, started this action just at the time when the foreign political situation is very grave. When I asked the Führer about it, I had the impression that he did not know anything about these events. End quote. The blowback was immediate. Chamberlain in England was completely discredited. He had carefully navigated through the rough foreign policy of the past year, only for it to blow back in his face. He'd made Hitler out to be an honest man who could be reasoned with, and due to this, Europe was indeed spared war in 1938. Now, however, the warmongers like Churchill had invaluable ammunition to throw at Hitler, to which Chamberlain would have no reply. How was Chamberlain to know that Hitler didn't order the pogrom, and in fact tried to put it down? Even if he did know, how on earth would he be able to convince the world of that? The answer is, he couldn't. There is nuance to the situation, but the reality is that this isn't how the world works. No matter who started it, no matter who tried to put it down, the reality was that dozens of Jews were dead. David Irving puts the figure at 91, John Tolland puts it at 36. 814 shops have been destroyed, as had 171 homes. Most symbolically of all, perhaps, was that 191 synagogues had been put to the torch. Goebbels would try to say in his defence to Hitler that such a brutal response would prevent further assassinations in the future. In 1936, Wilhelm Gusloff, the founder of the Swiss National Socialists, had been gunned down by a Jewish assassin in very similar circumstances. Now it had happened again. He reasoned that violence, which the Germans had not yet resorted to, must be responded to with violence. Goering told Hitler that he must punish the propaganda minister, but the Führer could only reply that Goebbels, despite his many faults, and no matter how out of favour he was at the moment, was invaluable. Goering testified at Nuremberg after the war, quote, I was making every effort in connection with the four-year plan to concentrate the entire economic field to the utmost. I had, in the course of speeches to the nation, been asking for every old toothpaste tube, every rusty nail, every bit of scrap metal to be collected and utilised, it would not be tolerated that a man who was not responsible for these things should upset my difficult economic tasks by destroying so many things of economic value on the one hand, and by causing so much disturbance in economic life on the other hand, end quote. Before talking about Hitler's reaction, he said that Hitler, quote, made some apologies for Goebbels, but on the whole, he agreed that such events were not to take place and must not be allowed to take place, end quote. In fact, it wasn't only Goering, but pretty much every leading Nazi who came out to condemn Goebbels, Wolfer Funk, Reich Minister of Economics, was heard on the phone by his wife to say, quote, 
Are you crazy, Goebbels? To make such a mess of things, one has to be ashamed to be German. We are losing our whole prestige abroad. I am trying, day and night, to conserve the national wealth, and you throw it willy-nilly out of the window. If this thing does not stop immediately, you can have the whole filthy mess." End quote. Everyone seemed to understand the calamity that had now befallen Germany, except the propaganda minister, who continued to cope, saying he had done the right thing, when in fact he had doomed his country to international hatred. Hitler, however, instead of condemning Goebbels also, or even saying he had made a mistake, chose to side with him publicly. Despite doing everything he could at the time to prevent the events, that was as far as it went. Now, he sided with Goebbels. A few days later, he would impose a collective 1 billion mark fine on the Jewish community to make up for the murder of Raff and for the resulting damage in Germany itself. It was as if Hitler knew his bridges were now burned, and instead of towing the fine line he had previously, he threw his hands up and decided to stop playing the international game in order to stand by his invaluable propaganda minister. Privately, however, he still raged against his actions. He said to Gerdy Troost, the widow of his former architect Paul Troost, quote, It is terrible. They have destroyed everything for me like elephants in a china shop, and much worse. I had the great hope that I was about to come to an understanding with France, and now that, end quote. Foreign Minister Ribbentrop, the man most responsible for trying to keep the international reputation of Germany out of the gutter, said, quote, As for that little beast, Goebbels, have you heard what his gangs have done everywhere? These imbeciles have smashed up the Jewish shops, which have long been Aryan property anyhow. They've spoiled my game for me, end quote. One of the things that annoyed Hitler the most as the backlash continued over the coming weeks was the hypocrisy of the Western powers. The Brits and the French talked and talked and talked about the plight of the Jews, but in response to Kristallnacht, the Brits actually tightened restrictions on Jewish immigration to Palestine, as they knew there would now be a new influx. Goering said of Hitler's thoughts at the time, quote, He wants to say to the other countries, Why are you always talking about the Jews? Take them! End quote. To summarise, Herschel Grinspan killed an innocent man who in fact shared similar views to him. As a result, he indirectly made things far worse for the Jews, but indirectly helped bring about the world war that would, despite much bloodshed for his own people, defeat Hitler. It's a bit of a crude comparison, but when George Floyd was killed in 2020, predominantly African Americans, but also others, set America on fire for days or even weeks. Thousands of shops were burned, and dozens of innocent, mostly white, civilians died. As a result, many Americans who were not racist before now became racist due to this outburst of violence. The same was the case in Germany. In response to the act of a single crazed Jew, many Germans took it out on the entire Jewish community. As a result, the Germans turned people against their own cause, and by extension against them. Ambassador Dikoff, the German ambassador to the US, said that until Kristallnacht, most Americans were happy to ignore the anti-German propaganda, but now even German Americans were furious. What particularly strikes me is the fact that, with few exceptions, the respectable patriotic circles, which are thoroughly anti-communist and, for the greater part, anti-Semitic in their outlook, also begin to turn away from us. The fact that the Jewish newspapers still write more excitedly than before is not surprising, but that men like Dewey, Hoover and Hearst, and many others who have hitherto maintained a cooperative reserve and have even, to some extent, expressed sympathy towards Germany, are now publicly adopting so violent an attitude against her is a serious matter. In the general atmosphere of hate, the idea of boycotting German goods has now received new fuel, and trade negotiations cannot be considered at this moment." End quote. Effectively, Goebbels' actions had ripped to pieces any sympathy the world had for Germany. They had managed to barely play between the lines so far, and had actually garnered a lot of sympathy and understanding for their tough post-war position, but now they were effectively a pariah state, condemned by the world. Being pro-German in foreign nations was now a nearly impossible stance to take, as it was so deeply unpopular. The condemnation was almost unanimous. Even if Hitler wanted to take an anti-Goebbels line after this, none of it would have changed. He would lose one of his most important men by far, his genius propaganda minister, but he would gain nothing. The world would still hate Germany. Nothing he could say or do would change that now. The bridges were burned, and the Third Reich would have to face the world from this new position, no matter how unwinnable the situation seemed. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you made it this far, then please do leave a like and share the video. It helps a lot.
As always, however, the biggest thanks of all goes to my Patreon, Subscribestar, and YouTube members. If you'd also like to support the channel, then the links are in the description. Even the $2 tier helps immensely. Thank you. Thank you to Lobster to You, Darway Lololol, Sigma, Emperor Titus, Luke David Murphy, Chechen Natsok, Anton Berglund, Levi E, Friendly Brian, Mr. Malabar, Bushak, Firefly Enterprise, Henry Unruh, Evan Brightfield, Chef Jeff, Ethan Wynn Stanley, Wunderwaffer, Mr. Bloom, Gav D, Guy's Long and His Hanno, JD, Green Rebel, Angus Roxborough, Rucksacker Too Heavy, Alexios Podcast Watcher, Citadel, Haste, Bojan M, Rick Me, Mr. Gaming, Cameron, Sludwig1919, Gloomy, Troy Harser, Jagdkampf, Rowan, Swedish Chef, Honda, Mirko, David Byers, Max Anton, Gragas, Conqueror, It's Okay to Be a Nationalist, Inflection Point, Vet Exempt, Automat 762X39, Monsoir Mercier, The Waller, Suma Klubiek, Jorgen1997, and Admiral Kempinski.